live. Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Hey, Josh. Oh, and uh, and welcome to Dark Ozarks. Hope everybody's having a good evening. I uh, this really doesn't have anything to do with the paranormal, but I can't believe that two weeks ago it was minus twenty, and right now I have my windows open. Yes. Uh, yeah. I was threatening to turn on the air conditioner earlier because it was that humid inside. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yet, uh, two weeks ago, it, it was minus twenty nine windshield. Yeah, yeah. Only a only a ninety degree, only a ninety degree difference in temperature. Uh, I will take it. And, <laughs> and speaking of ninety degree turns, uh, we we, ha we have a couple of interesting. Uh, topics tonight that are probably 90 degrees from each other <laughs> i i think you're probably right although with the joplin connection and its proximity to liberal missouri uh there's there's uh, uh some some tie-ins i think we can do there let's let's jump right into bonnie and clyde and then okay. head on over to spiritualism okay so uh, I, I always start, you know, when, because we do we do uh, we do live events about Bonnie and Clyde in the area, and I always start with the fact that sort of a big myth is that uh, people assume that Bonnie and Clyde is a Texas Louisiana story. Correct. Because they met in Dallas, uh, both were living in Dallas when they met, and of course met their demise in Louisiana. But most of their story and the story that people know now as the legend and the romantic legend actually happened in the Ozarks. It did. It did. And, and particularly in the, uh, what is now the Tri-State Mining District uh, with the, 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 the largest, uh, largest city in, in that region being Joplin. True, true. Although they, they were active in, in Arkansas as well mm -hmm. and uh, actually uh, hit out at a uh, motor camp in Arkansas for a time period. One of the things that I think is, is really evocative about Bonnie and Clyde is that they became these outlaw folk heroes really at a, at a point uh, of early modernization that uh, is in some ways not not dissimilar even from the way we live now mm -hmm. and, and so the idea that um, motor courts motels um, cars uh, <laughs> these the you know things that that we, we've all grown up with this was part of the the fabric of of course their their you know their their process but also a fabric of their mythos yes yes i mean and, and maybe perhaps one reason that it has become so romanticized is because there, there's a, a familiarity there that is uh bigger than even say with jesse james from the area because mm -hmm. we the things they did and the way they hit out and everything are, are things that people would do now and and maybe we relate a little bit because you know it all started out of sort of economic desperation and then yeah. it kind of snowballed into a thing a juggernaut that was bigger than they were and 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 they were aware of that i mean um uh, Bonnie wrote poetry and, and we, we know this from things that were left at the Bonnie and Clyde hideout. And I love the fact that we actually have a place in Joplin that is just simply known as the Bonnie and Clyde hideout. Yes. <laughs> and everyone knows where it is. Um, and uh, the, uh, her purse was left there and film and all the famous photos of Bonnie and Clyde are were recovered there and actually most of them taken in the general area um but it's 
it, it's something that uh, there was a self awareness. She was she wrote a a poem uh, basically that was a, the ode to Bonnie and Clyde, which basically foresaw their own their death. She yes. it, it's very clear that she realized they probably were not getting out alive. Mm -hmm. And that's there is there's a, a strong tragic element and there there is the element of course obviously they they were they were breaking the law and they were killing people yes uh, but i i think it's important to understand some of some of the structure and, and i do see uh what i i doubt that it was purposeful but there is a strong connection uh i would say almost a philosophical connection between what they did and what Jesse James did in terms of the fact that everyday Americans in both of these eras had been hit extremely hard by essentially industrialist America. Yes, and, and whereas Jesse James kind of got the moniker of Robin Hood of, uh, you know, of course, punishing the Yankee bankers and railroads and even giving back to the poor, which there are a couple of examples that, that probably happen, uh, at least helping people out. Um, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, they weren't doing that, but uh, I think that people living through the depression, I think at first they were horrified that these, you know, these gangsters were ro roaming and, and, and it is a very, Midwestern and Ozark area phenomenon. Most of the of the bank robberies during the Great Depression happened in the Ozarks and in Oklahoma. And um, so it's something that was very close. Um, but you had you had the similarity that people hid them out. Um, we. Uh, We've heard the stories at the at the Coleman people talking about you know hearing through the family you know they would come to jute joints or this or pl this place or that stay down the river and and hide out and I think people went from oh my gosh there's this lawlessness going on to someone's standing up to the banks who are foreclosing on everybody and everyone is helpless um, with the economy going on and then the dust bowl and everything else that uh i think it was a vicarious um thrill that people like to see you know that it, they're it, getting I, they're getting even that and i can't i, I agree and i and i think a, a a shared a shared sense of agency mm -hmm. uh when when so many people had been really that their their lives had been devastated by the um the stock market crash of 1929 mm -hmm. and 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 especially i think it's especially important to understand with that stock market crash so much of that economic devastation was felt by common people mm -hmm. who were these were not people who had been living large during the 1920s no, no, the, the, this was not a Great Gatsby wasteland situation. This was, no, these, these were farmers. These were, you know, small business owners. The, these were, you know, people who worked in factories and, and everything was gone. Um, you know, they would make a run on a bank and because, it, you know, if they got an idea that the bank wasn't, uh, couldn't pay up, then they got what they could because, that there was no safety net there. If the bank went bankrupt with your money in it, you were bankrupt. Yes, and that was uh, close folks close to me. Um, their grandfather had uh, just sold a bunch of cattle and put it in the bank. Well. And the next day the bank closed those stories happened a lot and and i think it's hard for people to especially younger people now to conceive of this but i mean i know i know 
I, when I was growing up and older people, there were a lot of people that still didn't want to put their money in banks and a lot of stories where people would, um, they'd hide their money. And it, it was the same situation as during the civil war. People buried their money in the backyard rather than go to the bank. And uh, there's a there's a story uh, out of Galena, Kansas, which is just the very edge of the Ozarks, um, of a store owner that even in the '60s he would you know the the rumor was he he didn't put his money in the bank and everyone would always wonder what you know what what happened to it and the story went that uh, he he bar- he would dig up part of the floor in his store he had a little general store and he'd stuff jars full of money and when he got so many he cut out a certain section bury them and then pour concrete over them and put the floor back down absolutely mm-hmm. yeah and that's what people did mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and you know and, and i think one of the one of the one of the tragic byproducts of that in later generations was some some of those people would become targets yeah yeah for shysters and yeah Mm -hmm. i mean or just to try to see if they could go find someone's money yeah yeah but it's it 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 was a sign of how unsettled and unsteady the times were in which it it is and and, and that's how how these games how, how these robbers thrived and with bonnie and clyde um and others that were very centered in the Ozarks, Pretty Boy Floyd, for instance, um, they they knew people here. They they uh, had lots of connections. Bonnie had lived in Commerce, Oklahoma, which is a stone's throw from Joplin over yes. the state line, and so they had connections. And they would come here because she knew the area. And, right. Um, and just over time, you know, things started going bad. You know, a robbery would go bad. Someone got killed. Uh, they ended up taking a police officer for uh, uh, hostage in Springfield uh, was the first one. Um, and things just, you know, over time got really bad. And then Joplin was sort of a high water mark of when things started really um, going bad. They had... Um, they'd actually decided we're taking a vacation. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I guess that was a bad move. I don't know. They, they had rented a place and it's actually a garage apartment and they had rented it for three months. I think it was. And uh, supposedly taking a vacation, although there's indication that they, they, they did hold up a, a a jewelry store, Neo show and a couple of places (laughs) in Kansas while they were here. Well, it's a working vacation. Well, you know, <laughs> opportunities. <laughs> and um, Clyde's brother had just gotten out of prison and he had just got married. Uh, his wife's name was Blanche. And, I, and Blanche is a very sympathetic character in all of this. She's the only one who survived. And um, they just got married and she had no idea that uh, she had married into a family of robbers. And so this is her honeymoon. They show up here and, and um, they, uh, they were living large and partying a lot. And the neighbors started complaining. They thought there were moonshiners <laughs> in, the, in there. So they called the police one morning, the neighbors did. Wow. And um, thinking, you know, we've got some moonshiners in there. So basically, they send out um, six officers thinking, you know, that's all they're, you know, someone's got a still in the garage, basically. Mm-hmm. And when they, when they arrived, um, basically, um, the guys had, had just gotten back from somewhere. And Blanche and Bonnie were upstairs in the bedrooms. And um, shooting started happening. And Bonnie was standing, I've I've been in I've been in this this apartment, I've investigated it. Uh, bullet holes are still there. 
uh, Bonnie was standing at the top of the stairs and she um, uh, bullet lodged in the wall behind her head. Oh. And um, so the girls just, you know, basically grabbed what they could and ran. And in fact, and Bonnie left her purse in fact, and um, get to the garage. They're starting to leave. Um, the officers were taken by surprise, certainly didn't think they were dealing with a gang like this. And two officers were shot. One of them fell in the driveway. Mm -hmm. And while some people, you know, th th these stories get to be galvanized and, you know, just these pop culture, one dimensional things. But, and so people assume, you know, it was just so cold blooded, but um Clyde would not leave pull the car out of the garage with the officer laying there because he was not he would not he would not drive over him wow uh, so actually his brother uh gets out of the car Clyde's brother gets out of the car and while the officers are behind trees and shooting at them he actually drags the officer off out of the way so they and then gets back in and they leave mm. And one dies on site, one dies in the hospital later. Um, I've, um, at different events, I've had people with connections to this come up and talk to me. One was um, um, a granddaughter of one of the officers that died. And um, she said that uh, he left that morning, her, her mother was, um, a child, I don't remember exactly how old, but uh, he had said uh, he was going out the door. He had gotten the call that they uh, they had to go rouse some moonshiners. He'd be back, he'd be back in a little bit, and they never wow. saw him. Um, another lady, um, and this is sort of interesting. Kind of get to the end of the story with the uh, with the massacre, and then and the massacre when they kill him in in Louisiana, it really gets. Um, that it got really personal, it got really personal for the Texas Rangers. And basically they, they set it up and it was pretty much overkill. I mean, there were over a hundred bullets in the car. Um, but um, she said that um, her great, a great aunt lived down there and actually had a beauty shop two doors down from the funeral home who attended the bodies and that uh, she did the makeup and hair for the funeral home and that she her great aunt is the one who prepared the bodies and always said that bonnie was pregnant that she looked like she was about six months pregnant my goodness and of course that's never been verified or you know put out there and the theory behind that is uh the discussion behind that that i've heard is that that was buried because since they had started getting this folk hero status that yeah. if it got out that they had killed her and she was pregnant that there would have been a huge backlash towards law enforcement and and probably rightfully so yeah but the, and the irony was they were they were trying to turn themselves in. Even worse, yeah. Which which does kind of make you wonder. Maybe she was pregnant, and that was the reason they were trying to turn themselves in. Very realistic. It's some really interesting and tragic complexities and nuances to a story that we think we know. That's right. Now you mentioned over on Instagram that you you had watched the the. Uh, Warren Beatty, <laughs> Faye Dunaway movie recently. Yes, yes I, I did. I watched it. So watching that movie, and, and some people, you know, I'm sure have seen it, some haven't. I know there's been remake in the last few years. Watching that movie and then knowing the facts behind it, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's, you know, it obviously the the film is is recognized for its cultural and aesthetic importance mm -hmm. regardless. And that comes through. 
It's it's an incredibly uh, stark, evocative film. The performances are incredible. Uh, and not just of the stars of, of Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, although they are incredible. I, I think something that is, that is interesting, and I, I love the storytelling process that they go through, because a story like this is incredibly difficult to piece out. And so you have, yeah. to, you have to understand that with a, you know, a comparatively short film, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that have to simply be given the impression of. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that they are very, very powerful in that impression. Obviously, there are artistic liberties that, uh, that take place. Something that is, is largely interesting to me is a lot of the locations are hinted, but never really flushed out. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the, the very event that you were talking about um, with the hideout and the shootout in Joplin, we see that in, in essence, but it isn't terribly clear where it is. Right. I think at some point in the movie, it, does, it mentions Joplin, uh, you mm -hmm. know, but, um, but it's not real clear. And, and for instance, the, uh, the scene where um, they get the drop on the Texas Ranger. Yes. Um, that's actually uh, supposedly, uh, had, that supposedly did happen in this general area too. Mm -hmm. Although and it's that, not, not fleshed out. I, I think that, you know, obviously there are, there are standout films that you really get the impression that the um, the that the actors involved were a hundred percent committed to their roles, mm -hmm. and and I think that that especially when that's a depiction of uh, of real people, that's a, that's an honor. And uh, I think that you know one of my takeaways from the film is that those who were involved with the film that it they were a hundred percent committed to these, think, these people. I think so. And in fact, um, um, Warren Beatty had, had, had worked for uh, several years trying to get the film made. And mm -hmm. so it, it was a uh, sort of one of those projects of, of love um, at that point for him. And it came through for everyone. I, um, I, another one, I, I think Gene Hatman did a wonderful job yes. as his brother um that's not uh, recognized as much um but it just um i, I think the the one thing is the, the film too did cement that idea of the tragic love story um and and in part because of the aesthetics i think you know uh it's easy to get carried away you know watching warren Beatty <laughs> pay done away <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and think, oh, you know, how, 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 how amazing this is, but their lives were not nearly as glamorous or pretty as depicted in the movie. That's the one thing. Yes, I think that's very fair. Something that, um, that I think narratively was, was very interesting, was very well done. Obviously, it adds an enormous amount of pathos to the, to the characters is, um, Bonnie, being played by Faye Dunaway, beginning to experience death premonitions. Yes, and and I think that that I think that was really based on um, two things. One one is the poem that she wrote, mm -hmm. uh, and I think two a little bit. There's a biography that later on um, Blanche Barrow, uh, Clyde's sister-in-law, who's the only one basically that survived um she wrote and and alludes to some of that as well it's uh that uh that is pretty intense the the, the cornfield scene um what uh what starts is actually an incredibly comical scene involving of all things an incredibly young gene wilder yes uh, <laughs> ending ending with something that i think is very very haunting there's so much comedy in that that moment and then somebody asks 
Gene Wilder's character, what he does, and he says he's an undertaker, and and Bonnie forces them out of the car. Yeah, and and I, I think it's 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 really well done, um, and and a good visual display of I'm sure what was going through their minds at times. Yes, as as yeah. well as the the scene of of with her mother yes that's intense. Um, and basically your mother just saying don't come home you know mm -hmm. you're you know yeah she she realizes that they're not getting out either mm -hmm. and and no amount of big talk from anybody is is going to change your mind the only thing i always wondered and in, instead of going to louisiana and trying to turn themselves in uh, if they had um, gone to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is, it's interesting to think about. I mean, it really is pretty incredible. But yeah, but that's one of those things that when you're in those moments, and I think it's hard for people to conceive of the, the mental state that would be going on when you're constantly on the run constantly looking over your shoulder you get to where you're not thinking as clearly either yes and the fatigue wears on and and you know so you could say well why why did they do that you know um why they really trust that this was not a setup when they you know even if they had they were going to be in prison run for the border and you just really have to think that living in that state for so long and, and there's comparisons with that with jesse james as well right right and, and what happened with him too so and, uh, and and i think but i think you hit on something that essentially as as fugitives it it had to have taken an enormous amount of toll and then you you start potentially making very irrational decisions exactly exactly very few very, i think very few people can do that and and maintain that rationality uh unless you know when they are continuing to have brushes with with the law or or you know mm -hmm. put themselves out there it's that one, one more one more robbery then we'll stop mentality and <laughs> You know, uh, Jesse James kind of succumbed to that as well. Yeah. What do you think of the the hideout in Joplin as a location for paranormal activity? It has long been uh, associated with activity, and I can say that uh, we we did have some activity and the. Um, the room that seemed to have the most um, activity and strangest energy was actually um, uh, the one that uh, Clyde's brother and Blanche were, uh, had stayed in. And I don't even know that it has anything to do with them per se, because mm -hmm. it had, you know, it was an apartment that was rented out for decades. And if there's energy there from that time, I mean, it could be from them, but I'm, I'm thinking more that the officers, mm -hmm. you know, you had these guys who, you know, they, they, they thought they were uh, going to go raid a, you know, a local yokel still didn't really think about it and end up walking into basically almost a trap yes and um with one of the most ruthless games in the country mm -hmm. and i'm sure they all had that moment that they probably all thought they were going to die uh yeah. under fire and they were out they were uh outgunned uh they were when you're when you're standing there and looking at that situation, uh, it is amazing that more of them did not die. Uh, 
there was no place to hide there was i mean they, they were they they walk up and it's just open you know there's nothing <laughs> you know the, it, there was a tree and i'm not even sure that the the tree that they talk about that they hid behind i don't think is there anymore but literally it was there was like a tree and that was it wow. and they're still talking about maybe 15 20 feet from the driveway mm -hmm. incredible and, and so that kind of energy plus the two officers who did pass uh, yeah. i think probably have more to do with that plus um it is a place that i think kind of may fit that um what we talked about last week with the with the buttery sprites um as being one of those places that people being in can cause energy because it has become so infamous and people so many people have been there to experience a place that they can say bonnie and clyde were there right. and I, I i wonder what kind of energy that sort of pilgrimage has has created that's a really good question it'd be it'd be interesting to to analyze some of that from that perspective mm -hmm. and i and that almost feels uh more right than that plus the officers i i, I think um it, it is one of those places people want to go see and um because they want to touch that legend mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and that so makes sense. I, yeah and i think that i think the people going in affect that energy mm -hmm. in that place. yeah absolutely so do we want to do we want to make our our uh our 90 degree turn at this point to a very different kind of paranormal i i think so kind of kind of like stealing a different car and going a different way <laughs> i like that <laughs> i like that which of course is spiritualism yes <laughs> which seems like a you know uh, a really odd thing to talk about after this but uh, it does, it does. i like it a a beautiful combination of uh uh genteel new england sensibilities combined with uh, uh carnivalesque hucksterism exactly do you, do you want do you want to explain you know sort of how it got started on the east coast a little bit uh, yeah i'll, I'll uh, give the the basic primer for people who um are, are not familiar with with spiritualism uh spiritualism is a recognized religion largely in part to uh, avoid um, uh, accusations of everything from witchcraft to hoax mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the in the mid 19th century. It was a concept that ha had certainly begun to gather some some ground uh, before the Civil War, but after the Civil War, it became incredibly popularized. Mm -hmm. I think that the the industrialization of of the West and, and by West I mean Western civilization, not the American West, uh, that that uh, industrialization sort of the the uh, the stripping away of of the metaphysical and the replacing it with uh, the the hard industrialization uh, certainly pushed a uh, an idea and of course. The spiritualism in its essence is using a medium to talk to dead people in its strictest uh, most blunt uh sense yeah and and after you know something that we see about the same time and you know in approximately the same generation as the rise of spiritualism uh we see the the development of gothic horror mm -hmm. with uh especially in, in america with edgar Allan poe and we we also see the development of the the german romanticism movement with uh art and music and literature that has a high degree of focus on the individuality of human reasoning and and uh a you know heavy step into the metaphysical yes um sort of in tandem uh stepping into the metaphysical 
but not constrained by formal religion formal religion as it existed very very much so and also not constrained by the folklore of the past true i mean it, it really is kind of sprang from a well itself it, it did and i think it, to a degree a very modern um modern at the time contemporary uh, american well but of course what really pushed uh spiritualism was the casualties of the american civil war with uh three quarters of a million dead in battle and a a nation grieving for uh, essentially grieving for closure and understanding and wanting to be able to touch uh, in some way, in some metaphysical way, to touch their lost loved ones. Exactly. And not only just the, the, the sheer numbers, but so many uh, uh, people didn't have the closure of, of funerals and loved ones coming home. Some did, but many did. Many were buried at battlefields and in later national cemeteries. And so you, you had families left with, you know, their sons or husbands or brothers, you know, buried a thousand miles away, maybe. And um, suddenly the the procedures, the the traditions for uh, you know home funerals and 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 grieving didn't fit, and uh, people sought something more, trying to have closure. Um, we talked on Instagram just briefly, but you know Mary Todd Lincoln is a is a prime example. Um, yeah. She she lost three sons in the course of the war, and her husband in in a very tragic way and so she was left her oldest son Robert was the only child she had left and she really became obsessed with spiritualists and but ironically during the course of the war what a lot of people don't realize is Abraham Lincoln actually was pretty interested in spiritualism very much uh, so yes and when you mentioned about uh, death premonitions of that Bonnie Parker had uh, of course, Abraham Lincoln famously had one for himself. Yes, he did. Uh, Pretty chilling. Very chilling. Um, anyone that's not familiar with it, um, it, several days before he was assassinated, he spoke to a friend saying that he'd had a dream the night before that he, he woke and he heard uh, crying and sobbing in the White House and he walked through um, and I forget what the, the room was called at the time, but I guess it's the East Room now. Um, and he walks in and he hears someone say that the president has been assassinated, has been killed. And he walks over to the coffin and looks down and he sees himself. Wow. That's and, incredible. And it's within days of his assassination. Yes. So the, the beginnings of spiritualism formally are largely traced to two young girls mm -hmm. uh the fox sisters and actually, what, there, what, what's that there actually were three later two of them were more active but there, there okay. were three originally okay. and and this is in the the finger lakes region around seneca new york yes and uh was something that just as we're talking uh, that is a complete pop culture reference but as we're talking and i'm starting to put pieces together uh the uh long-standing and extremely popular uh disney attraction the haunted mansion mm -hmm. in uh, in the magic kingdom in disney world of course there's two of them well there's lots of them there's one in disneyland as well but i'm specifically talking about the one in disney world uh because the one in disney world is designed with a new england uh slant to it the one in disneyland is designed with uh uh, Southern plantation slash New Orleans, yeah, slant to it with the bayous and everything. But going over to the one in Disney World, um, strong New England emphasis, and there is the the Disney Imagineers who designed this, I believe, in the nineteen sixties, um, really drew heavily from spiritualism and that American movement. It really did, without saying it. Yeah, and the. Uh, you know, the, the medium 
there's a medium, there's a, a very strong New England motif, there's Gothic horror, there's, uh, you know, the, the idea that there's uh, spirits largely continuing their everyday life around you. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of it is maybe terrifying and some of it may be funny, which I think is reasonably fair. Mm -hmm. um, how did, how did the Fox, what, what, tell, tell us a little bit more about the Fox sisters. Well, they, they basically um, started uh, communicating with the dead through Ouija board, supposedly. Mm -hmm. And for those that sort of recoil at the, the word Ouija board, um, mm -hmm. it was not viewed in the, in the uh, same way that um, pop culture today has cast it as this thing of evil. Um, talking boards or spirit boards is what basically what mo they usually were called then um were parlor games i mean people that that's they did it for fun it was not viewed as um conjuring that kind of thing um and but they got the idea that they were communicating they were actually communicating with spirits uh, later in life, one of the sisters basically said, you know, because they came under a lot of um, uh, criticism and a lot of people tried to debunk them, uh, prove they were um, faking. And one of the sisters later on indicated, yeah, that they, they had embellished, they had made up some of the stuff. Um, um, but it was much later that, that she did that. And who knows? And by that time, the the movement certainly had um, traction. But and that's how it started, and um, impressed people around them enough, and 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 people who were um, serious minded, uh, mm -hmm. professionals, doctors, etc., that they couldn't explain what was going on. That they ended up with converts, believers that they that they could. Uh, speech of the dead and over time they ended up basically stars uh, of, of the time they traveled across the country and you would have big events they would go to big theaters or opera houses or places like that and put on demonstrations you'd have big crowds uh, it was a sensation uh, and people were craving you know this kind of affirmation that these loved ones that they didn't get closure with were on the other side yes. that they just weren't lost in the ether and mm -hmm. um they they did come to the ozarks they came to st louis and um and it's it's interesting because st louis the st louis area actually was kind of a i don't want to say a hotbed but a center of spiritualism and for famous spiritualists to come through because it, it was a big city in the 1800s is one of the top 10 most populous cities in the country as well as being a transportation hub yes. and and so um one over time the spiritualist movement became very deris derisive so you had you had your proponents and then you had your critics and you had people who were trying to prove that they were fake uh, making it up, and some were found out to be to have faked um, their results. You had people who uh, would stage everything and have tables that were had um, mechanical devices so that they could have them tip and move and so forth, um, basically on command. And and uh, big productions where um, you know lights would go out, and when they came back on something would have happened that would indicate a communication or something um and so you ended up with these detectives trying to either prove that this was true or prove that it was false and um the fox sisters were no different of being criticized um they did come to st louis and um they actually found a um a uh, supporter in in Joseph McDowell, Dr. McDowell. Um, our favorite reanimator. Our favorite reanimator. Actually, probably, 
I still have to say, I think Dr. McDowell is maybe the most fascinating character in the <laughs> Ozark. <laughs> I, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Between the yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> usually the 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 moniker of mad scientist is somebody that you read their history and you're like, I'll just run away from that person now. Dr. McDowell honestly seems like he would have been a blast to be around. Oh, definitely. I, I I think, you know, sort of the old question of, you know, if you could sit down with someone and, and for dinner and have a discussion, he's definitely one of, you know, my, my, towards the top of my list of, I, I would just be very fascinating. <laughs> for one thing, he, he was absolutely brilliant. He was not crazy. He was absolutely brilliant, a brilliant surgeon, a brilliant doctor, but he was also very interested in, in the supernatural and yes he felt that we could communicate with the dead and so he was fascinated with the the fought sisters and he attended their demonstrations in st louis and um attempted to um investigate and review it critically and his conclusion was what he saw seemed legitimate um now you this is someone that didn't just have a slight interest in 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 the the thought of the afterlife you this is someone who um who basically tried to preserve his his daughter when she died at 14 to a point in time that you know perhaps she could be brought back to life she was he was probably the first person to seriously contemplate that idea yes, yes. Uh, he also buried his first wife on top of uh, one of the mounds in um, St. Louis one of the original Indian mounds that later appeared. I did not realize that was there a specific purpose he was going for I assume there was uh, spiritual connection actually okay Wow. And uh, uh, I'm not sure what happened to her body. I think it was moved later because, of course, the mounds have, were all taken down. But that was as early as the 1840s. And uh, then he, of course, he, he ran the first medical school west of the uh, Mississippi and uh, reanim was a reanimator. Um, his uh, medical students were. Uh, enlisted to obtain cadavers from the yes. cemetery which led to a lot of uh, hostilities and um uh, rightfully suspicious um immigrant populations particularly the irish and the germans very fair and led to his pet bear being loosened on the crowds and cannons on on top of the <laughs> the medical school etc so you have you have quite this background but then um you know he also um was ended up being probably the most respected doctor uh, of his time um especially as an educator so yeah all this together but he he um he was really one of the very first ghost hunters in america interesting yes very very interesting that's uh and he his his deceased mother visited him and yes. warned him uh, uh actually assisted him in his escape from what a crowd that was probably ticked off about the grave robbing Yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, an incident, they, they, they thought that the medical school had, had um, dug up a particular uh, recently deceased woman, ended up, yep. they, ended up they hadn't actually in that situation, they, they found her later. Um, but, um, the, you know, they, they literally arrived with torches and pitchforks. 
<laughs> and had made their way into the medical school. And um, Professor uh, Medell actually uh, was uh, trying to avoid the crowd and is visited by the spirit of his mother who shows him which way to go to avoid the crowd. You know, this is the stuff that does not make it into the Chamber of Commerce brochure. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, then his reputation, you know, uh, got further entwined with the spirit world when um, during the Civil War, he, he actually was the Surgeon General of the Confederate Army of the West. He was in charge of all medical services in, in the Western Theater. Uh -huh. And so the Union promptly um, commandeered his, his medical school and right. turned it into a prison. And the fact that they had to, um, when they were digging out the basement for the dungeon, that they were digging through many feet of bones uh, created the further stories that the medical school was haunted. I think that's fair. I Probably think that's fair. fair. Is the is the is the location uh, is the building still standing? No, no. It uh, it it actually it was um, it was taken down in in the eighteen seventies for a railroad, uh, and they put railroad tracks through. Currently, now it, it the location is the parking lot for Anheuser Busch. No, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, Perina, Perina. Oh, okay. Okay. Where, where is it in, do we know where it is in relationship to St. Louis University? Um, <laughs> well, it was across the street from St. Louis University. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, um, uh, Dr. McDowell was not fond of St. Louis University because he had been the, the, the city doctor um, at, at one point retained by the city and had been let go by a, a, a superior who was a Catholic in favor of replacing him with someone from St. Louis University, one of the Jesuits. So periodically he would sh uh, shoot one of his cannons across the street towards the, towards the uh, medical school at St. Louis okay. University. And, and just a tie in from two weeks ago, this is the, the St. Louis University Medical School that with um, operated by the Jesuits that would also become associated with the exorcist. That's true with, with the Alexian brothers, yes. Yeah. Yes, there, there are deep connections there. <laughs> it, is a, it is a small world. I. Um, Real quickly, how are we on time? I know we started a little late. Uh, we, we've got just a little bit. Okay, let's, uh, let's do a bit of a teaser on liberal and then next week pick up by really digging into the, the sociocultural and paranormal aspects. Sounds good. Um, many people would not know that liberal Missouri in Barton County, Southern Missouri, started as a utopian uh, community. Yes. Uh, and you, you, you had, you had two, you kind of had two movements at the same time, um, the spiritualism and then utopianism, and they kind of melded in certain places. Uh, utopianism was um, the idea that of rational uh, free thinkers, science, um, logic, and that we should um, follow those tenets and not um, not get metaphysical and religious ideas mixed up in, in our daily lives. Yes. And liberal was started by uh, a man named Thayer uh, who uh, was from Lamar, Missouri, which is kind of just down the road. And so he bought a large tract of land and started this free thinking utopian community. And uh, there were no churches. Everyone uh, who lived there um, basically agreed not to 
bringing religion or metaphysical issues into their daily life. Yes. And it went well for a little while. And then um, the Christian community in the area, mainly from Lamar, said, you know, basically, we don't like what they're doing. So they set up their own camp alongside and they called it Pedro. I find yeah. it interesting that they named it Pedro. I don't know. I, I do too. And I, and I also think that, you know, it's uh, an, an, perhaps for the, the founders of, of the, the rational thought utopia um but uh, they they really could not have done a better job of inadvertently hanging out a sign that said please come proselytize and do your missionary work here because you don't have to travel that far to do it that's true that's true well but of course at the time you know there, there weren't that it was it was still pretty sparsely populated not many cities so i think he figured you know i'm you know I'm what, 15 miles away, <laughs> you know, know. leave me alone. Um, yeah. But then it turned into a, 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 a spiritualist center when um, the founder and his wife had some um, pretty interesting experiences in their hotel yes. uh, that basically pushed them towards a spiritualist um, side of things which in enraged the uh the neighbors even more <laughs> you just can't make anybody happy no you can't um and ironically um the um the community try you know basically kind of shies away from this topic and you know kind of oh that didn't happen here kind of thing Whereas other places have kind of built on that past and used it as a way of bringing in business and tourism, uh, New Harmony, Indiana, for instance, um, mm -hmm. another and, one in the West. And, and Lilydale. Oh, Lilydale for sure, yeah. And, that... But instead, <laughs> you know, uh, liberal has kind of done, you know, well, don't know what you're talking about. Um, I think that it, you know, from a, probably later to mid 20th century on is is a concept that is really difficult for just an, an everyday farming community to wrap it wrap their heads around and i'm i'm saying that from having come from a you know a pretty strong everyday farming community well and i i agree with you there i i uh, um I think that's true, but on the other hand, um, there's still a lot more tolerance than I think a lot of people give credence to in the area of, you know, sort of live and let live, you know. Um, I agree. Uh, I, I think it would be less of a um, seen as a danger or something to, that you had to attack now than it did in the 1880s when this was going on. Mm hmm and maybe a thought for next week is why. I think so. I think so. And, you know, something, of course, that we always land on is that sometimes there's no easy answers. The, the issue of spiritualism has so many moving parts and uh, so many elements that while, of course, spiritualism is not limited to North America, North American spiritualism has some really interesting dynamics to it that uh, from uh, religious components to counter religious components, intellectual thought to intellectual thought countering uh, the position, the, the juxtaposition of um, what could likely be genuine paranormal experience uh, combined with uh, carnivalesque hucksterism, as I said before, uh, hoaxes and uh, you know a general obsession with celebrityhood, but then also real real experiences. It's, it's a there's just so many different moving parts. Well, that and then and then as you go forward, I guess one last little teaser maybe for next week is that sort of the culmination of of the spiritualist movement is in its resurgence uh, around World War One. Yes, uh, and. Miss Curran and Patience Worth, which again, 
we find ourselves back in the Ozarks. Yes, we do. Really incredible. And I, I think it speaks to the, the element of crossroads, both uh, uh, literal and metaphysical. Yeah, more, more than one just uh, axis there. many many moving parts and uh, yeah good stuff i there's a lot about the the connections uh to the ozarks that i before we started researching for this week uh was unfamiliar with well uh i'm glad that uh uh, i see i didn't realize that as we said we were talking about topics i said you know we haven't discussed <laughs> spiritualism in those arts yet, and uh, um, and there's and then there's more layers to it even than, than we've talked about. But um, it is a fascinating movement, and I think and here's something maybe for next week to ponder. I think there's parallels with spiritualism of that time and the current interest in the supernatural. Yes. Yeah, I I would I would concur, and and certainly the potential for you, you could almost think of of spiritualism. I w- I would say spiritualism would be the almost the great grandmother of modern day paranormal. Pretty and much. Are- <laughs> I, I I would I would say so, um, and um, so maybe we can. Uh, and delve into that a little bit more too. And what does that, how does that relate to 2021 now? It does. I think that's, I think that's, uh, first of all, I think we're really, really interesting. Second of all, got some, got at least one personal family experience that I'm looking forward to sharing next week. Oh, cool. <laughs> Fantastic. So, of course uh we appreciate everybody for tuning in everybody for watching uh when it when the the videos are on later for on the rewatch not on live and as always please share your thoughts um and uh if you have ideas that you want us to pursue or some personal experiences that you would like to share we promise to treat them with the utmost of respect exactly exactly and you all are uh, as much a part of this as we are. And yeah. and I'm glad to say that, that you all have taught us some things that we were not aware of and you give us some more adventures to go on. Yes, you do. And we appreciate that. So everyone have a good night, have a good week and we'll be back next Wednesday. Sounds good. Y'all be safe. Night everyone. <laughs> night. See you Lisa. Bye Josh.